Okay, awesome. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, myself and Sam for uh, this session. Um, before we start our session on the Gang of Four design patterns, um, I want to quickly highlight um, Danny George as my uh, applicant for Our Giants Are Female under the hashtag Our Giants Are Female. Uh, Danny George is a great leader within science, technology, and mathematics. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Danny quite a few times uh, when I uh, worked at National Instruments, and now she's gone off to do great things. She's the, um, I believe, the second president of the Institute of Engineering and Technology. She's presented the Royal Institute Christmas Lectures, which is a great honour here in the UK. She's been awarded the Michael Faraday uh, Prize, worked at NASA, European Space Agency. Um, she's, as I say, she's a great leader, great inspiration within uh, science, technology and STEM uh, more generally. Okay, but we're here today to talk about powerful design using the Gang of Four. Now, if you're unsure about who the Gang of Four are, they are the four people who wrote this book here. And if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, um, this is a must-have, uh, essentially a Bible or a catalog of all of these great design patterns. The design patterns, design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software. And so in this soft, sorry, in this presentation, Sam and I are going to go through a couple of these design patterns and really hopefully be an eye-opener to all of the different design patterns we have available, perhaps aren't taking advantage of in LabVIEW. So let's start off with a quick quote by Chris, Christopher Alexander. He says that each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment, and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the same solution a million times over without ever doing the same thing twice. Now, uh, Christopher Alexander is designated the father of uh, design patterns within software, but he started off life uh, designing towns and cities as an architect. But it's very easy to see how instead of buildings, doors, walls and windows, in software, we can have objects, interfaces, modules, and classes to hold everything together. But within LabVIEW, we're, we're already familiar with some design patterns. Hopefully you all recognize this design pattern as the humble finite state machine. And the finite state machine is really awesome for things like sequencing, and you can change the order in which items occur based on your transition logic. In then further on within our LabVIEW career, we might move over to the QMH or Queued Message Handler, or another dual loop design pattern such as the producer consumer. Even from these items, different people within the community have created things like the JKI state machine by JKI, the DQMH by Delacour, the Messenger Library uh, by uh, James Powell, Dr. James Powell, uh, Workers by Scarf Controls, and the Actor Framework, which you can derive uh, from the QMH using OO principles. But these design patterns are constantly evolving. For example, you may have seen the channeling wire design pattern or the channeled message handler, which, which was introduced a few years ago to take advantage of channel wires or Jeff wires. And I must admit the first time I saw this design pattern, I was a bit confused. I had never used uh, channel wires before, but it goes to show that we are constantly evolving. But as I say, within the LabVIEW community, I believe, and uh, Sam and I both agree, that there are a huge number of design patterns we're simply not taking advantage of. And that's where it comes from, from 
object-oriented uh, code. And so to tell us more about the Gang of Four and design patterns within, I'll hand you over to uh, Sam Taggart. All right. So uh, when we talk about the Gang of Four, as Tom mentioned, we're talking about this book called Design Patterns. Uh, it's got four authors. That's why it's called Gang of Four. It's got about 20 different design patterns. I think there's 23 to be exact. And they're divided into three groups. There's how we create objects, how we compose them, so how we put them together, and then how they interact with each other. And uh, Stefan Lamans is the one who put me onto this book called Dive Into Design Patterns. If you go to refactoring.guru, it's on sale right now for 10 bucks, so you can't miss it. Um, it's a much more newer uh, redone. Look at the design patterns. The original book is about 20 years old. It's very computer science-y, and it's kind of a dull read, I think. Um, the Dive Into Design Patterns looks at the same design patterns, but uh, gives you different examples and I think better examples that are easier to understand. They're both good, uh, but for 10 bucks, uh, you should go get the uh, Dive Into Design Patterns book. Highly recommend it. Uh, downside is there's no print book, it's just an ebook. So, why design patterns? Well, number one, don't reinvent the wheel, right? You're going to end up with a, a bicycle with square wheels if you try to do that. All the, there's a lot of problems in computer science that we face every day that have already been solved and have solutions out there. So, you know, use the proven solution. I'll give you a second to read this uh, comic. But basically, if you ever sat in a design review and somebody explains their code and at the end you're like, yeah, I have no idea what you said. Uh, that's why we need design patterns because it gives us a common language that we can talk about. And I can say I'm using whatever pattern, the factory pattern, the visitor pattern, something like that. And people instantly know what I'm talking about. And so you don't have to memorize the entire book, but you should at least be familiar with the different patterns so that then you can have conversations about them and about your code. All right, so the first one we're going to look at is the decorator pattern. And uh, there's a little text there uh, that comes from the book. Uh, but basically, we start out, we write our code. We have, in this case, a function generator, right? I mean, it's a class, right? And so it spits out data. And somebody comes along and says, hey, I want the data from the function generator, but I want it scaled, right? Or filtered or normalized or maybe you know, any one of those. And our normal response, what they teach us in the LabVIEW object-oriented programming class is, well, that's easy. All we do is create a child class, right? So our function generator has a get data method that returns an array of data. And uh, we just override that. And then this scaled class, this is the scaled one, uh, we call the parent to get the data. And then before we spit the data back out to the calling program, we do our scaling, right? And any parameters we need, we store inside the object, and, and it all works. And the ones for filter and normalize look very similar. But this starts to fall apart, because what if somebody comes along and says, hey, I want the data not just scaled, but I also want it filtered. Well, now what do I do? Do I create another child class that says scaled and filtered? And what if I want filtered and normalized, right? So things just kind of explode. And what if, in addition to this function generator, I have other sources of data, like something reading from a file or maybe a oscilloscope or something else, right? And how do I handle that without recreating all these classes? So what you'll find is if you just rely on inheritance, your inheritance hierarchy explodes, and you have all these special cases, and it's not the best way to do things. So let's take a step back. And uh, hopefully, most of you recognize these. They're called Matryoshka dolls. It's a Russian thing. Uh, basically, there's one doll in the center that's solid, and everything else are these shells that go over the, uh, the uh, inner doll. And uh, each one is a doll in its own right. And so our... Uh, we're going to call the inner one the component. And that's going to be our file gen or function generator or file, right? That's what's generating our data. And then we're going to have all these decorators that go on on the outside of it. But part of the key is each of these decorators is also a component, right? So each of these decorators is also a doll. We can treat it like a doll. And these are our scale, filter, normalize, whatever other manipulations we want to do. And so our class hierarchy kind of looks like this. Uh, the black arrows are supposed to be inheritance arrows. I couldn't figure out how to do the white triangle. Um, so we have our data source, which is what the whole outside world sees all these as. So that'd be the equivalent of the doll. And then we have some concrete data sources. We have our file and our function generator. 
And then we have the idea of a decorator, which are like our hollow dolls. And each one of those hollow dolls includes another data source inside it. And then underneath our decorator, we have concrete decorators. So these are the concrete. So the, the decorator class itself is like an abstract notion. It's a notion of having a hollow doll. And then specific hollow dolls would be the scale, the filter, the normalize. These are the concrete implementations. And so uh, here, if we look at the little snippets on the right, right? So our decorator class itself, when we call get data on that, it's just going to pull out the data source that it owns, and it's going to call get data on that. And then for our uh, scaling here, and this all of our uh, decorators are going to look similar. We call the parent class, right? Which then call is calling the the owned data source, and then we take that data and we manipulate it before we spit it back out. And you can do stuff before or after you call the parent. So there's some cases where you might want to do that as well something before you call the parent. In this case, we're just manipulating the data after we call the parent before we uh, pass it back. So that was all like static, right? That's how you set up your class hierarchy on disk at edit time. At runtime, you actually have to put all these together. And so we take our function generator class, which is the inner doll, right, which is our uh, component. And then we take a scaling class, which is one of our outer shells, right, one of our decorators. And we set some, some values on it. And then we decorate our function generator with our scaling class. And then we take that scaled thing and we decorate it again with a low pass filter. And then we decorate it again with a normalize. Right? And then we can take that wire that's coming out of that last decorate and we can call get data and it'll give us back data that has been scaled, filtered, and normalized. All right, quick demo. Hopefully you all can see my uh, screen here. Uh, so I should have already opened that. I don't know why I didn't. Any questions while we're uh, waiting a second for this? Wow, why is my computer so slow? All right. So here we have, uh, we're using a factory. So I wanted to show you that you can combine some patterns. So you might be familiar with the factory. All this does is it takes in an enum. And based on the enum, we're either spewing out a file generator or a function generator. It's a function generator. When you call it gets data method, it presumably reads a function generator. In this case, it's just simulated. Or you call the file reader, and it reads something from a file. And here it's just prompting for the file before it passes it out. And then we take that data source and this array, we have the data source, we have the scaled data, we have scaled and then filtered, and then we have normalized data. And here we're just taking all those, we're calling them, so we put them all in an array. So we have an array of data sources, and for each data source, we are calling the get data method, and then we're plotting all that. And then down at the bottom, we're just setting the plot labels. So I can run this, and here I get the original signal. Scaled signal, scaled and filtered and normalized. And if I want, I can select a file instead. And it'll prompt me to select the file. And I'll just pick one. And here we've got the same thing. So we can mix and match at runtime any of these, the original data, the scaled, scaled and filtered, normalized, and do any combination of those. All right. Uh, I've got one more slide here. Uh, so decorator use cases. So these are some use cases that I've seen where you could do stuff like this. <clears throat> you could, uh, if you have test steps, you could uh, add a decorator at a pre or post step, right? So maybe you want to switch some uh, switches on or off before or after a step, or maybe you want to uh, do something with storing the results, right? And maybe you've got multiple different ways to store the results, files, databases, things like that. And you can mix and match those. Uh, for serial communications, you can add a decorator to encrypt data before you send it and decrypt it when you get it back. Uh, and you can do the same thing with uh, adding CRCs or checking those. And then you can also use it for caching. So your decorator can have store all the previous times that the VI ran. And if it comes up with the same inputs, it can just spit out the output instead of doing the calculation. So there's just a few use cases. And now I'm turning it back over to Tom. 
Cheers, Sam. Um, before we uh, move on to the state pattern, uh, I believe Shane O'Neill had a question of, is this approach in danger of violating the uh, list of a substitution of principle? If not, why not? Do you want to take that on? Um, yeah, I, so I know what the list of substitution principle is. My thought process is that if you gave your calling code a decorator that didn't decorate something, then yes, it would violate the list cost substitution principle, but otherwise not. Because basically, in my scenario, I'm calling get data, and I don't, any of those that you give me is going to give me data. The only one that would, if you didn't wrap something, you might get back an empty data set, but that would be it. And I think that's like predictable, so I think that's fine. I don't know. Where's Dimitri? He's the one who's uh, all into that. But I totally yeah. see where you're coming from, Shane. So hopefully that explains it. All awesome. Right. Thanks, Sam. Right, so the the next pattern we're going to talk about is the state pattern. And so a bit of an academic um, definition here. Allow an object to alter its behavior when its internal state changes, the object will appear to have changed its class. OK, so over the next couple of slides, hopefully, will put some meaning behind that definition. For this design pattern, I've decided to go with a really straightforward example. So suppose we have a cash machine or an ATM. That cash machine has various different actions it can perform, such as um, initialize. You could insert a card, insert your PIN, your personal identification number. You could request cash or you could eject the card. But there's also um, a load of other actions that the ATM could support. And then that ATM could be in several different states. So for example, it's the ATM could be in a state where there is no card. It could have a card, it could have accepted a pin, or it could be in one of the error states where it has no cash. Of course, we could extend the number of states, such as if the user enters a card that's uh, blocked or wanted by uh, law enforcement, the ATM could go into a, a shutdown state or an, uh, a locked state. But now with this design pattern, let's create a grid of actions versus states. So in this action versus state, as we develop our code, I think it's fair to assume that when we initialize the ATM, we assume we're in the no card state. So I'll put a one in here. The next action we perform, let's say the user inserts their credit card or debit card. Suddenly we go from no card into has card. So we move across a state. If then the next action, we insert a pin so we can go from the state of has card to has pin. Or if they insert the incorrect pin number, you could just stay in the has card state without transferring. Even when we, when we request some cash, we could withdraw some cash, even depending on whether the ATM has any cash left over, it may go into the no cash state or stay in the has pin state. For example, you might want to withdraw uh, cash 20 times for whatever reason. And then finally, we could eject the card. If then we go from the has pin state into the no card state. And if you've done your CLD or done any sort of sequencing type program, this sort of design pattern should look fairly uh, straightforward where you have a sequence of items and you have uh, some transition logic to say which state we're going to go into. However, pay close attention. What if you initialize your ATM, but there's a credit card stuck inside, or you insert a PIN number uh, without a card being there? As developers, when we've designed the software, we must have thought, well, that can't happen. And so we might not have programmed that in. And that is the source of many, many bugs. So if I want to insert a pin number, 
but there's not a card in the cash point, well, we have to know explicitly what's actually going to happen uh, to that uh, cash machine. So if we move over to some actual LabVIEW code, we're going to define all of these states as classes. And these classes can implement uh, this interface called ATM states. And if we just zoom in onto ATM states, ATM states has eject card, has card, insert pin, request cache. And these states match the actions. But underneath, we have a context class. And by context class, in this instance, we're talking about the ATM class. So at the bottom here. And so in each of these methods, in like eject card, initialize ATM, for example, we're going to be in one of these states. And while we have a look at some of the code, hopefully that sounds, that makes much more sense. Okay, so here's the block diagram for insert card uh, dot VI, which is this VI here. If we open up that VI, as a sub VI, we have a dynamic dispatch VI called has card, and that's based on a particular state in. So remember from the previous slide, we have these different classes. Then on the block diagram, we have a different type of object uh, going through. So the ATM state could be no card, has card, has pin, or no cash. Well, let's assume it's no card. So if no, no card comes in and we insert a card, has card should come out. So a key takeaway here is that the state object input might not match the state object output. But let's see how that actually works inside. So with inside this VI, you can see that no card comes in, but the output, we're just simply changing the object that gets thrown out. So has card comes out. And the way we're able to perform this magic is that the connected pane has a dynamic dispatch input, but only has a recommended output. And so, so long as that recommended output is implemented by the interface of the states, um, it'll be accepted as an output. Okay, let's head over to a, a demo, but I believe uh, Mark has a question here. So uh, Mark asks, State naming is an interesting topic. Do you name it based on what has already been accomplished, has card, or the state it is trying to accomplish, uh, or waiting on card? That's an interesting uh, topic, and I'm pretty sure other developers will have different answers. Um, it's one of those things that at the CLA Summit, I'm sure there would be a big discussion or argument about. Um, I tend to do it in, uh, post, uh, so to say that we have already achieved this, this is the kind of state we are in. If you speak to someone like Steve Watts, he will do it in the present, such as waiting for card. Um, I don't know if someone else wants to jump in the, uh, in the chat and answer it differently, but to me it is uh, a developer choice. Okay, yeah, as Sam says, it, the importance is clarity, and so we want uh, consistency. Right, let's uh, do a demonstration. Okay, in this demonstration, I've, I've created that ATM example I was looking at uh, within the slides. If we have a quick look at the block diagram, you'll see it's a very uh, simple event-based uh, loop, where every time we click enter card, has pin, remove card, request cache, we just execute a different method. And those methods we see here. And just as a reminder, all of this code uh, will be available on our uh, GitLab page. 
Okay. Now, as I execute this uh, code, make a note of the software state in this indicator down below. So as we start the code, our, our starting state is no card. And we've set that just by using the initialize ATM. If we enter a card, look how we've changed from the no card to the has card state. If we enter an incorrect PIN number, uh, let's just say 3141, uh, and enter that, it says PIN incorrect, and we stay in the has card state. However, if I enter the correct PIN number, we've gone into the has PIN state. And if I request some cash, maybe 5,000 uh, UK pounds, I'm still in the has pin state, and my current balance is, what's that, just under one million pounds. That would be uh, very nice. Then if I remove my card, I go into the no card state. And so if I try and enter a pin number or request cash or remove the card, I stay in that no card state. Okay, um, I see the chat's been uh, a bit busy. So if you have any questions, um, Please so, um, the, the big question was uh, transferring data from one state to the other. Mm. And he's saying if you replace the object, don't you lose some of that state data? I think that was right, Thomas so, was asking that. So let's have a look at exactly how I'm overcoming that issue. Let's see if I if I'm doing it in this particular. Okay, I picked a bad example there. Uh, maybe request cash will. So Tom, my answer was okay. basically two things. Uh, one is you can have a method that transfers the data from one to the other. And yeah. then the other thought is you could store any data that you need in multiple states, not in the state, but in the uh, context and then just pass it in. Um, yeah, absolutely. So things like this uh, cash amount, um, the amount of money left in your bank account or in the ATM is just being stored in the context class, which in this case is uh, the ATM uh, object that's running in these shift registers. Um, another technique if you're transferring between um, classes, uh, you can use the reserve runtime uh, class function here, uh, and we'll see that in action a bit later on in the presentation. Um, but another thing to, uh, actually, yeah, let's leave it there, and then later on in the presentation, we'll circle, circle back to it. Um, were there any other uh, calls for memento pattern, if you like? Um, yeah, we have an example of the memento pattern on our GitLab page. Which, you, which should be publicly available either now or very soon. Okay, let's um, crack on. Okay, so if there were any more questions about that, leave them in the chat and hopefully we'll have time later on. Okay, the next pattern I want to talk about is the proxy pattern. Okay, so provide a surrogate or placeholder for object for another, sorry, provide a surrogate or placeholder for another object to control access to it. So there are loads and loads of reasons why you might want to control access to an object. Uh, the first three that just appear to come to mind are, uh, does the user have a valid license? Perhaps that particular object, that particular uh, class, you need a paid license, a commercial license to use it. And so unless the user has a commercial license, we, we don't want them to access that class. Another could be, um, has the data already been analyzed? Could I present that straight data straight away? So let's say we have a manipulation class or an analysis class that takes several seconds, if not minutes or hours to execute. Now, if we've already analyzed all of that data, perhaps we could have a data cache in the background. And so when the user um, 
was to view that data, we can just take it from the cache and throw it directly on the front panel without having to uh, go through all of the processing. Or perhaps that object actually needs to execute on a remote target. So um, instead of accessing the, the object directly, we want to send a message to a remote target to execute a particular method. And you might see an example of that with the nested endpoints uh, API that, you, that comes with the actor framework, or at least you can download it separately to the actor framework. Um, in the next couple of slides, though, I'm going to be focusing on this data cache. So if the data has already been analyzed, I'm going to show how we can use the proxy pattern to directly show, to show that data instead of reanalyzing it. Okay, perfect. It looks like uh, Stephen's answering some questions on the chat, so that's uh, much appreciated. He'll give a much better answer than uh, I, I could. Um, okay, so this proxy example, if I bring up the domain, close my other uh, VIs from earlier. What this proxy pattern example is going to do is send a command line, um, sorry, it's gonna send a command to your a command prompt such as who am I, IP config and system information. And let's just see it in action and then we'll explain it a bit more detail later. So if I select uh, who am I, it returns with Scientifica UK slash Thomas McQuillan. And so that's the company I work for and then my username. If I do IP config, it takes a bit of time, but it comes up with my IP address. If I run this again, it will come up with my system information. But notice how this takes a fairly long time to execute, even though it's already executed before. You can see the uh, busy cursor appear every time I click these controls. But now let's switch to a proxy pattern using um, a data cache. And so the first time I click these buttons, it takes exactly the same amount of time. But now if I click these buttons again, system information, notice how I'm able to display that data straight away. There's no waiting around because I've already um, got the data and I'm assuming with data caches that that data hasn't changed since the last time I checked. So I can now quickly go through my data cache and have the information update. I could, however, choose to clear that cache. That's going to clear all of the data out of my um, out of my class's private data. So now, if I look at system information, it takes a long time to execute again. But if I click on system information again, look how instant instantly it pops up. So I use this proxy pattern uh, for controlling access to objects a lot in um, image manipulation or, or image processing. Okay, if there are any questions, keep them uh, coming in the chat. Okay, let's have a look at how this design pattern actually works then. So I have uh, three classes here, if and one launching VI at the bottom. Uh, right at the very top, we have an interface. And if you're not using interfaces, all you need to know is that interfaces define behaviors. So it's defining the behavior of clear cache, IP config, system information, and who am I? And these just simply return uh, data. The first class that implements that interface is the Windows CMD class. And this always calls the system executive. And then at the bottom, we have the Windows proxy class. And what this is doing, it's checking to see if there is valid data in the cache. 
if yes, that valid data is passed straight out and published onto the front panel. Else, uh, this, uh, these VIs will call these VIs. So the proxy class will call the Windows CMD class to execute the actual functionality. And just at the bottom here, this piece of code is simply uh, determining, so it's showing how I determine if data is valid or not. Because in LabVIEW, we don't have a sense of null data, um, I'm just checking to see if a value in, if the value in is equal to a GUID that I've called null, then the data isn't valid, else it is valid. Okay, so within the system, sorry, within the Windows CMD class, we have IP config, who am I, and system information. And these VIs will always run system exec, which is this VI here. And then at the bottom here, this bottom class, uh, IP config, that will check the cache, so check my class's private data to see if real data exists. And if it doesn't, it will call IP config. But if valid data does exist, we'll just pass it straight out. Okay, so um, moving on to, okay, so I see there are a few questions yeah, um, how do you know if the data is valid without checking it against source each time you uh, request it? Yeah, so this is exactly what I'm doing, Peter. So every time I request to see um, computer info, let's say, or in this case, IP config, every time I want to see IP config, I get the data of IP config and check, is that equal to null? So if it is equal to null, then it means I need to go and actually get that data. But if it's not equal to null, I will pass this string straight through from here all the way out to response. And um, so I hope that answers your question, Peter. So is null is just doing a quick check to see if the cache is valid or not. And then up here, if it's not valid, I'll just run a uh, system exec to see uh, see what my IP config settings are. Okay, does anyone have any uh, final questions, comments, or thoughts before I hand over to uh, Sam? Okay, uh, Sam, you're muted. I was about to answer James' question in the chat, um, okay. but uh, let me share my screen. Cool. There we go. Presentation. Uh, all right. Um, so in answer to James' question, yes, I have found that this state pattern is sometimes overkill. Um, I've used Booleans. I feel like if you've got a bunch of Booleans and you're doing different things based on some combination, that's really where the state pattern comes into play. So anyway, uh, we are going to talk about the visitor pattern now. And I hope you guys ate your Reedies this morning and are ready for some uh, mental gymnastics because the visitor pattern is very difficult to wrap your head around. Probably one of the more advanced patterns in the design patterns book. But the advantage of doing all that exercise is then you get a lot stronger. And so we're going to learn a really cool technique called di our double dynamic dispatch. Right? So first, let's review kind of general dynamic dispatch. Right? So this is an example from uh, Chris Cellino. Some of you guys may have talked to him and know that he has this project. He has a project that does project documentation. So he had this LabVIEW project, and he needed to produce documentation for it that stayed up to date with the project. So he had wrote some code that when he made changes to the project, he would run this code and it would regenerate all the documentation. And basically, the code crawled the LabVIEW project and pulled out 
all the items, projects, libraries, VIs. Tom, uh, I can hear you typing, so if you could mute yourself, that would be awesome. Um, and so our project items have a add uh, method that allows it to be added to the report. And so our PDF report, we would pass it an array of project items. And the PDF report doesn't care what type of project item it is. It just knows it has an add method. And so if it's handed a project, it calls the project's add method. If it's handed a library, it calls the library's add method. And if it's handed a VI, it calls the VI's add method. And that all works really well. Right? And that's called dynamic dispatch, right? where the PDF chooses among the various options based on what specific type of project item it is. Now, the problems come in when Chris's boss comes to him and says, hey, you know, this PDF report's great, but we want an HTML report as well so we can throw it up on our website. Right? So now, depending on whether we have a PDF or HTML report and what type of project item we have, we have to do something different in each of these boxes. So each of these circles with the question mark, right? we want to call a different VI in each one of these cases. And we want to do this dynamically. right? So while the program's running, we want to be able to take a report, doesn't matter which kind, and we want to be able to pass it a project item and call the correct VI. So the first thing to do is to separate into elements and visitors. And the way you decide which is which is actually quite important. So elements are the things that are going to be visited. So elements are the things that have some kind of structure. In this case, we're going to make our project items the elements. And then the actions that we're going to take are the visitors. And it'll become important why we have to make this distinction in a minute. And then what we do is for our project items, we define an override VI at the top level called uh, accept visitor, right? So all of our project items will override accept visitor. And for our reports class, which is going to encompass all our different types of reports, we're going to create one dynamic dispatch VI for each type of project item. So there's some coupling there in that the reports class knows about each of the individual uh, types of elements, right, of the, of the uh, project items. Now, inside our override VI, so our first level dynamic dispatch, we take a report, any report, and we pass it a project item, and it calls accept visitor. But when it calls accept visitor, it calls a different accept visitor for the project, library, and VI. And inside each of those, inside the project, we call the visit project. Inside the library, we call visit library. And inside the VI, we call visit VI. And this is the second layer of dynamic dispatch. The first layer is based on what type of report I have, or what type of uh, visitor I have, I call a different, uh, or sorry, based on what type of project item I have, I call a different accept visitor. And then inside that accept visitor, I call a different dynamic dispatch VI on the visitor itself on the report. And what we end up with is then we call a different VI in each one of those boxes, right? So if I have a PDF report and I have, a, and I pass it a project item that happens to be a, uh, a project, Right. Then we're going to first dynamic dispatch and accept visitor. That's going to call the projects override of accept visitor. And that's going to call visit project. And that's going to go through and see, oh, it's a PDF report and it's going to call visit project. All right. Now, why is it important that we clearly define which ones are the visitors and which ones are the elements? Well, if we want to add a new visitor, and somebody comes up and says, hey, we want you to also generate a report and put it on a wiki, right? That's different than HTML or PDF. That's like some markdown text. And so here, if we add a new visitor, all we have to do is add one class, right? We, we add a class that inherits from reports, and we create the dynamic uh, dispatch overrides for visit project, visit library, and visit VI. And that, because we're just adding that one new class, we can do that dynamically. We can do it on the fly. We can create a plugin architecture that loads these, and it's really easy to add a new visitor. But what happens when we want to add a new project item, right? So projects have uh, project items, the project itself, right? We have a library. We have VIs. We also have custom controls. So maybe we decide we need to add something for custom controls. Well, we have to add the custom control class, which looks in the project and pulls out all the information needs for the custom control. But then we also have to recreate all these override VIs. So we have to go to the reports class, add a visit control override method. And then we have to go in each of these classes and override it. So we're not just adding the control class. We're adding the control class and modifying every single one of our reports. 
And so that's uh, a lot more work, a lot more difficult. And so that's why you want to pick as the, the structure you're going to visit, you want to pick the stuff that's less likely to change. So in this case, the project items are less likely to change. It's less likely the lab is going to add some new type of BI. Uh, it does happen occasionally, right? At one point, they added classes and libraries that didn't exist, and they've added VIMs and some other stuff. But that's pretty rare. It's much more likely that your boss comes to you and says, hey, I need a new report type for this particular type of user or something. So that's why you would set it up that way for the ease of adding classes. And we're going to look at a quick demo. Uh, let's see. And this one I already opened up. So here we have a simple demo that Tom put together, and it looks at credit cards and offers. So what it's going to do, I'll show you the result. We're going to look at, for different types of credit cards, we have bronze, silver, or gold. If you accept one of these two offers, you're going to get different amounts of cash back. Okay. So those are our two axes. And in this case, the bronze, silver, and gold are going to be the uh, ones that we're going to get visited. right? And the fuel and the hotel are the visitors, because it's more likely that we're going to add a new offer than it is that we're going to add a new type of credit card. And you'll see that our credit card has an accept method here that accepts an offer. And you'll see that our, hotel, our offers have uh, visit bronze, visit gold, visit silver. And so here we create an array of our bronze, gold, and silver cards. We create an array out of our offers. And for each card, we're going to go through each offer and we're going to accept it, and then we're going to read the cash back. So each of these is going to store uh, cash back inside the uh, card, and then we're going to read it out. And if we double click on this, except this is our first layer of dynamic dispatch. So based on the credit card, we're going to choose whether we call visit bronze, visit gold, or visit silver. If I pick one of these and open it up, then inside here, We're going to decide whether we visit so whether uh, we accept the fuel offer or the hotel offer. So based on which offer we accepted, we're going to do something different. And if we run this, it just generates this uh, nice array of information here for us. So that's how the double dispatch works. The first level is the accept, and then once you accept, then you call based on which of the uh, which class it was that accepted it calls a different method that is then overridden. Hopefully that was somewhat clear. Uh, if that didn't blow your mind enough, uh, the visitor pattern is often used in conjunction with other patterns. So uh, we have the composite pattern that we can use to represent tree structures. So this is really appropriate in the case of uh, LabVIEW project because right, you've got a hierarchy. You've got the project, and then you've got targets, and then you've got underneath the target, you could have VIs or libraries, and libraries can own VIs, and you've got classes, and you've got this very hierarchical tree structure. And so you can use a composite to represent that. And then once you have that, you want to you want to iterate over each of the elements, right? So you want to go through in each project item, you want to have it accept the visitor. And so one way to do that is to use something called an iterator which will pull individual elements off of trees or lists. So the iterator goes through a tree or a list or a group of objects in some defined order. So those are both worth looking at. All right, I think we're uh, at the end now. So it's time for questions, comments. Um, Tom, uh, maybe, oh, there's our uh, GitLab link. So https colon slash slash gitlab.com slash gof dash in dash lab view. Uh, not, we've got examples for many of the patterns, even some of the ones we haven't talked about. They're not all public yet. We're waiting. We're trying to review them and make sure they're all up to speed before we uh, publish them.